Thank you, Deborah. Uh, good afternoon, and uh, thanks for allowing me to speak today. Um, I'm going to break my talk up into a, a couple different segments. First will be a kind of brief history of Ridge Vineyards and Zinfandel. Then the next little segment will be um, how we grow Zinfandel. And then, um, most importantly, how, how we make Zinfandel. And at the very end, uh, I'll discuss the, the four wines in front of you. And um, please feel free, if I, as I'm talking, um, if you have any questions, I don't mind uh, interruptions. Okay, so with that, uh, Ridge Vineyards was founded in the Santa Cruz Mountains in 1959. And originally it was an estate winery focused on Cabernet. There was a little bit of Chardonnay and actually an acre of Ruby Cabernet that um, they were talked into planting. And um, the, the vines dated from, uh, it was a replant vineyard after Prohibition. It planted in 1949. And as they decided to actually make this um, winery uh, go, they realized that um, you know, it's pretty expensive being in the wine business and they needed more more grapes outside sources. So they looked around in the early 60s for uh, more Cabernet because that's really what their love was of um, Cabernet Sauvignon. But they couldn't find any old vineyards that were, were not already locked up with the few wineries that were um, making, making Cabernet back then. But they did find a lot of old vines um, of Zinfandel, many old vineyards. So... Um, starting in 1963, uh, they got into the Zin business. Currently, Zinfandel makes up about 65% uh, of our production. And um, we are focused mostly in Sonoma County, where we own or lease uh, 325 acres. We also have been sourcing fruit from a, a different, different areas, uh, mostly Sonoma County, but a little bit in, in Paso Robles and also Napa County. But over the years, um, the last 40 some years, it, it actually accelerated in the late 60s and into the 70s. Um, Ridge has made, uh, probably sourced fruit from over 120 Zinfandel vineyards and labeled at least 60 different wines as um, vineyard designated wines, single vineyard wines. And that's kind of where we focused our, our um, philosophy, winemaking philosophy is uh, find a site and make the wine from that site. We, try to, we do blending, but it's usually field blends, um, which uh, we can talk about a little bit um, later. So in Sonoma County, on Lytton Springs Road, we have a, a, a brand new little winery, a straw bale building that is, um, was specifically designed for Zinfandel. And um, this, this view is, is of uh, Lytton Springs looking south. Healdsburg is in the distance. And um, that's, that's our little, little <laughs> straw bale winery. Actually, it is the biggest straw bale building, apparently, um, in the world. So uh, now I'll talk a little bit about um, how we choose to, to grow Zinfandel. We are proponents of, of head training Zin vines. We, we um, grow it the old-fashioned way. We feel the head train, spur pruned without any wires, we think that the quality is just a little bit better. Um, somebody, somebody, oh, Paul Vertigal mentioned that it, you, maybe you have to uh, pay a little bit more attention to the farming, um, and that helps with the quality. But, uh, you know, we just think that the little bit that we've worked with cordon fruit, uh, we typically prefer that head train vines. Um, we feel that, that it's their, they become a little bit more expressive of where they're grown. and. Plus, when, you, when you're out there pruning, you have a place to put your beer bottle, <laughs> which is always good. Um, we are very lucky to have been able to um, acquire some land that has very old Zinfandel vines on it. Some of them planted in the 1880s, uh, some in the 1890s, and some at the turn of the century. Um, quite, a, you know, quite a few small blocks of um, old uh, pre-prohibition vines. Over the years, we've also planted many new vineyards, and um, we've tried to source some of our field selections uh, uh, wood from those old vineyards, and that's what we're going to be tasting uh, today, which we'll, we'll get back to a little bit. So on, on the Zin vines, it's, 
we do a little bit of leafing. We, um, we do a little bit of um, fertilizing, but typically that's just a green manure crop um, that we disc in. We'll do a little bit of composting if we have some weak areas. But what we, what we try to do is just make sure the vines are not overly vigorous or overly weak. And, uh, and Zinfandel is, it's amazing on the old vines that they can just um, keep, keep going and, and keep putting out you know, nice crops, even, even crops. I was, um, I used to be very uh, skeptical of, of um, you talk to a French viticulturist or chef de culture and they would say that, um, oh, it takes, you know, 12 years or so before vines actually kind of mature. And now that some of our vines are, that I've planted are that old, I, I tend to see that with Zinfandel as well. When the, when the vines are very young, we're easily dropping half the crop to get the intensity that we require for a red wine, because and they're just so productive. Um, as they get a little bit older, then they tend to even out their production and even out their quality, so you have less low years and, and more um, you know, better, better quality. So here's a, a picture of a pretty old vine. Um, plant, this one is uh, dates from the early 1900s. And one thing that we have done um, starting in, um, in the early 90s is we put irrigation on all of our old vines, all of our young vines too. And we, we do this um, for several reasons. Um, one of them is if we have a dry spring like we have had this year, we will add a little bit of water to help the vines along. We'll also use it during the summer and into uh, close to harvest to, count, to try to counteract heat spells. The most important reason why we have water is to um, give the vines a really good drink after harvest, just so that they can try to rebuild some of their um, energy for the, for the coming year. And we, we choose um, uh, drip irrigation, that's, uh, you know, that's what everybody does. And we're lucky enough in the vineyards that we farm that our frost risk is um, fairly minimal, knock on wood. And this is, this, I chose this picture because it, it, it kind of illustrates why I like um, head trained vines. The, the fruits arrayed around the, kind of around in a circle. Um, there's good light exposure, but not too much. Yeah, the clusters are big, but they're not overly big. And, um, it, and it, it just, and this, this vine is about 10 years old, I believe. So it, it really, it helps. It helps um, limit the cluster size. Zinn has really big clusters. And when, when, I'll, when I start describing the, the first three selections um, today, and I'll say it tends to be smaller, it tends to be larger. Well, it's all relative. These are big clusters, big berries. And uh, before we go into making wine, uh, I want to stress that at Ridge, we have um, two major other varieties or two other major varieties that we always seem to um, blend in with Zen. And this is usually because in our old vineyards, they are already mixed in and interplanted um, with those old vines. This is a picture of, a, of an old Carignan vine planted in a, a, what's about 115 years old. It also has leaf roll too, see the red leaves? If you, uh, you can't quite see them, but um, the wine, wine made from Carignan, it tends to um, blend really well with Zen. It lifts the nose a little bit and it adds a bit of acidity to the, um, it freshens up Zinfandel. It's really interesting to look at, at older vineyards, um, say Dry Creek, for example. You go to, on the southern end toward the city of Healdsburg and you look at um, old vineyards, they're always mixed. I, I, it's really rare to see an, an old, a vineyard that's older than, that's pre-prohibition, that isn't a mixed planting, mixed blacks. It's got other, other varieties in it. On the south, southern end of, the, of Dry Creek, the cooler side, you'll have less Carignan and more varieties like um, a little bit of Alicante or Petite Syrah. As you go further north, what, as it gets warmer and warmer, they, the old timers, they, they knew what they were doing. There, you see a higher percentage of Carignan. Uh, the same holds in Alexander Valley. If you go around Cloverdale, you'll find almost 100% Carignan vineyards, um, where in the heart of um, Alexander Valley around Geyserville, it's maybe their Carignan makes up 20% of a, of a blend, more or less. The other variety that, um, oh, and, and please, if you have any questions, yeah, have at it. 
Oh, the question is, um, do we do we pick it all at once or keep it separate? If if it's from a, a mixed vineyard, we pick it all at once. And in fact, in uh, 2000, after a few years of nagging, I was able to um, plant a mixed black vineyard, um, a brand new vineyard. So it's 60% Zen, the 15% Carignan, 15%. Petit Syrah, and then a whole bunch of other varieties, including Mataro, Syrah, Grenache, Alicante, and a few whites, um, which is which you can find almost in a lot of older vineyards. Um, and we pick that all as one. In the in the newer blocks that we plant as uh, separate varieties, then we do harvest them separately. So we'll, but if it's already mixed in the vineyard, we pick it as a, as a unit. Uh, Petit Syrah is much um, is very susceptible to you type you type a dieback um, probably more so than almost as bad as Cabernet and so you don't find a lot of old uh, pets vines. Uh, this is a 13 year old Petit Syrah vineyard um, that is um, some of it is in wine number four. So uh, now we're on to harvest and um, and making making wine out of the Zin grapes. One of the one of the blessings and one of the one of the um, detri detriments to uh, head trained spur pruned vines is that you, there's no way yet that we can mechanically pick them. So everything we do on these vines is by hand, uh, especially at harvest. We decide to pick our vines mostly on taste. We keep a uh, you know a, an eye out on the weather. We also watch our sugar numbers, and we try really hard to keep our um, wines under 15% alcohol. Typically, it means, um, but when we're picking on taste, that we're over 14%. Um, it's really hard to get uh, a Zinfandel in Dry Creek or Alexander Valley for the intensity of flavor that we need in our wines at, at under 14. It happens every now and then, but not very often. We try to make table wines. We, you know, if it, if we decide to make a late harvest wine, we really make a late harvest wine. Um, it's something that has so much sugar in it that it that um, you have residual, and so you know it's a, a um, late harvest wine for dessert. Table wines uh, with Zins over 15 percent, they're they have a limited lifespan typically, and it's hard to match them with food. And so what we what we're trying to do is is make a make a, a table wine that will age gracefully, and and um, you'll be able to enjoy with lots of different food. So our harvest hand harvest, we do we try to sort as much as we can in the field before it goes into a gondola. Um, you know, after that, it's it's pretty standard. We we um, dump dump the grapes into a receiving hopper and make sure that we you know if we see any rot, which some years worse than others, um, will if it hasn't been removed before it was uh, or as they were picking, then we look at it and try to get it out then. And then we go to a, a stemmer crusher with Zinfandel. We fully crush. Um, we put the rollers right up tight and. Um, we want to be, and we do that because with Zinfandel, with its big berries and thin skin, we try to get as much extraction from the skins as possible. And uh, to do that, it's best to fully, fully crush everything. And then we have, um, a, we usually do a pump over. Did I? Uh, we do pump overs, and we have two types of, of um, fermentation regimes for, for Zinfandel. One of them is with a floating cap, which is in the picture here, where it's just the standard small small fermenter. Um, we prefer we prefer smaller fermenters, five or six tons for Zin. The the other type of regime we use is a, with a submerged cap, and in a submerged cap, it looks exactly the same, except that down about a third of the way into the tank is a little um, metal perforated perforated metal um, lid. That that sits and holds the skins underneath the um, the rising juice as it starts to ferment. That aids in extraction, and we really like that in, um, I'll say, our Paso Robles Zen, which is um, a little bit gentler, and we want to get all of our tannins. We use it a little bit in the in um, our, the wines in front of you from our Geyserville Vineyard, um, at our Lytton Springs Vineyard on more clay soils. It's got they have a little bit broad, more broad-shouldered tannins, and so those we typically use a floating cap because we can control the, um, the the amount of extraction a little bit better that way. 
We go for um, very short, warm fermentations on our Zin. If, if we can get it up to about 90 degrees, that's you know, just sublethal for yeast, we, we do. Um, and you know, the fermentations will last anywhere between five and 10 days. And typically we, we press at dryness, sometimes a little bit before, but typically at dryness, we do no extended maceration on, on our Zin. Another thing that, that we don't do is inoculate either for yeast or malolactic bacteria, or for the malolactic fermentation. We just rely on, um, on the, the native yeast that are uh, on the vines. And um, we, we really, we do prefer that. We think it makes a, a, a better wine. And this darkened up quite a bit, I'm sorry. This is just a, a, a tub where we, we pull, wine, pull wine out from the bottom of the tank and then we splash it to aerate it in the, in the tub before we pump it back over. And that just aids, uh, keeps the yeast um, invigorated. And we, we, uh, we like that quite a bit. Pressing on Zinfandel is um, typically 90% of the time, all of the press goes back into the free run juice. And that is um, not the case with Petit Syrah, but um, certainly with Zinfandel, that's, that's pretty much what happens. And everything, uh, or the decisions to, de or the decision for when to press the wine is based on taste and a lot of experience. Uh, Paul Draper has been the, the winemaker and CEO of Ridge Vineyards for almost 40 years, um, getting close. And uh, we, we still relied a lot on his palate. Um, the other, we have two other winemakers, John Only and Eric Baher, who, but, um, and they're the ones out there out there also tasting and tasting. Um, it, you, can, you only have one time to press. And what we've always found is that um, making decisions early on in the winemaking process is, is always better for the wine. So if you can press the grapes or the wine before it gets too tannic, then you have to work with the wine less as it's aging. And uh, that, that is uh, one, of, one, of the, one of Paul's great gifts to um, winemaking. We age all of our barrels in small cooperage, and we use American oak, and we have for um, almost the for 40 plus years. Um, typically, with our vineyard designated Zinfandel wines, it's about 20% new. Some years 25, some years a little less. And we've always uh, preferred American oak to French oak for all of our wines. Um, it, it, gives a, it gives a little bit different flavor, but it tends to, well, you, you, you just have to try the wines. There's a little bit more vanilla in the, in the American oak, and it gives a little bit less sweet than French oak. This is a picture of a new vineyard planted at, planted at our Lytton Springs property that is a, um, I call it our mini heritage. Vineyard. We have uh, seven field selections from mostly from Sonoma County, um, and I can, if if anyone's, if you're interested, I can go into detail on all the different ones, um, different selections that are in there. But it's done in cooperation with Rhonda Smith, the um, extension viticulturist for Sonoma County. We are going to, uh, we have it's in planted in two stages. Um, one of them is to viticulturally evaluate doing replicated trials, and that's what Ron is in charge of. And then the other one is um, just planting out enough, about 500 vines of each to do, not replicated wine lots, but commercial wine lots. Included with those uh, seven field selections are, is uh, FPS 3 Zinfandel and FPS 3 Primitivo. And hopefully with um, when Zerliana Kastelianski and Pribidrog get uh, cleaned up and, and uh, released to the public, then we'll be able to include those in either this trial or, or a new trial. So um, any questions? Yes. Yeah, the question is on the submerge cap and the technique that we use, and it, do we still pump over? And yes, we do. Um, what, what you do is you have a, a, long, a long rod that's perforated at the bottom, yeah, and you stick it through, through the hole in that um, submerged cap. And we, and we do that for aeration may, more than anything. You still get a little bit of extraction, but the, because 
most of the cap is under the liquid and it's bubbling around it. You're getting plenty of extraction, you're just not getting any oxygen once they've really started their alcoholic fermentation. So if you take it to a tub, you can aerate it, keep the yeast healthy and going, and then you put it back. Yeah, it, it depends on how you want your fermentations to go. If you if you grit it and and don't aerate it, then you can you can extend your fermentations out. And some people like that. Uh, what what we found we that's that's not our style. We don't we like to try to get it get the um, grapes fermented as quickly as possible so that we're pulling the tannins and anthocyanins and um, well mostly the tannins from the skins and limiting how much um, the alcohol interacts with the seeds to extract the seed tannin. Because we're, we're, we're all about trying to maximize the extraction we get from the skins and not the seeds. But, yeah, you're welcome. Fred? Um, David, is uh, 2000, are the differences this pronounced in all vintages, or is 2003, because of the nature of the year, were the clonal differences that much greater? Because to me, the differences are very pronounced much more than I would expect given the from the same site. Yeah, the, so the question is, um, the differences that we see between the, the, the three selections here, is that, um, is that, was that made more pronounced by the year? And I would say yes. 2003 was a really good vintage for us. It was um, a long harvest period. It wasn't overly, um, it wasn't, it didn't have a huge crop, and it wasn't so hot at harvest that we had to just scramble to get everything picked. We could we could pick off each each block as we felt when we felt that it was um, ready to go, and that is precisely why we bottled these three selections separately because they really show what what the selections have to have to give. Other years, um, I can just off the top of my head, 2004 was very warm at harvest, and we had a couple of heat spikes that limited the um, or that burned the fruit a bit, um, so the crop was a little low. And it got it was fairly warm at harvest, so we had to really run in and pick um, everything as fast as we could. The differences were still there, but not not to, this, to the same extent. And also, um, 2003, the vines were 12, 13 years old. We'd already been getting fruit from them for about 10 years. And what we do with Young Zin to try to get the complexity that, that we need in our wines is we let them get a little bit overripe or a little bit riper. Overripe's the wrong word. We let them get riper than we have to, than we um, would get our uh, older vines. So to get the same flavor intensity um, on young Zin versus say the old patch that's 115, 120 years old, we need to go uh, maybe two degrees bricks higher and the higher you go in sugar, the less differences you see between, say, such subtle differences as, as these selections. Um, you can still pick out Dry Creek from Alexander Valley or from Russian River, but it's harder to say, okay, they're growing side by side, growing vines side by side by side in, in Alexander Valley, and you go to 26 and a half bricks instead of 24 and a half, um, you're going to see less difference. It's gonna, going to be mass. But that's the, and, and by 2003, um, the vines were, were old enough that we were, we were picking them probably about the same as we were picking the 45-year-old vines or the really old vines. So that's, a, that's another thing that we try to do with, um, with Young Zen, to try to get that complexity. It's a, it's a tough grape to grow, and it's a tough grape to, to you know, really make a, a, a really a rich, full-bodied wine that's not over the top. And um, yeah, so that's that's where that's our picture of it. Yes. Uh, the question was barrels from different coopers, and yes, we do. Although probably 60% of the barrels come from one cooper, um, World Cooperage, and probably 80% of the barrels come from the Appalachians, uh, the western side of the Appalachians. We we like that that wood quite a bit. And they're all, you know, it's, it's that whole thing where with, with um, barrels is that what really matters is um, how, they're hand, how the wood is handled. It needs to be air dried instead of, um, you know, and for maybe, you know, 18 months to 24 months instead of steamed or dried in a kiln 
that makes a huge difference with the, the quality of the tannins that you get and the flavors that you get from the barrels. Yes? Oh, that's uh, the spacing on that is eight feet between the rows and six feet between the vines. Um, in a moderate area, moderate vigor area, eight feet is uh, for head trade vines. That's about the, as close as you can get uh, without um, really beating up your vines when you're trying to spray them uh, or you know control mildew on them. Um, as it is, we typically have to do a little bit of tipping to get our tractors down for the last um, two or three sprays or dusts. In a, in a more vigorous site, um, we'd, I would say nine feet would be adequate. And then um, what, I've, what, I've, what we started to do is every eighth row, we go a little bit wider so we can get a tractor done at harvest um, without breaking off the, any, any shoots and spur positions. Six feet between vines down the row is just about enough to um, allow, the, allow the shoots to attach to each other but they hopefully will stop growing before, they're, before the shoot from one vine is shading fruit from the other vine. So that's, a, you know, that's about as close as, as I prefer to get. I've seen some beautiful vineyards in the south of France that are uh, four feet between vines, and um, they just go with less shoots, and it, it kind of becomes, it, it's all right. I think you could, you could get away with that. We choose to go to um, six feet. And I might say that, I might mention that the old patch, those really old vines in Alexander Valley, they're 12 feet between rows and four feet between vines. So they look like um, you know, something you'd see at Bandol almost, except a little bit wider. Yes? Oh yeah, the question was any tannin additions or co-fermentations, and yes, we will, We'll co-ferment um, blocks that are already mixed already. We'll, we will pick them as a unit, and whatever is in there will be co-fermented. Um, and our my stock answer for tenant additions is is petit sirah press wine. <laughs> After you've made, you know, if you need it, we'll, we'll, we prefer to use other varieties instead of, um, say, wood tannins in the fermenter or whatever else is out there. Like, what is it, Color Up? No, Color X? I don't know. Yeah, we, we prefer to... We we try to get the we try to get um, maximize what the quality of the tannins we get from the vineyard and uh, try to maximize those tannins from the vineyard in in the wine. Yeah. Uh, yes. Sure. <laughs> a, a vertical cordon um, is where you basically form form a cordon that goes up and down. So you use a, a tall stake on, and it's still a head trained vine, but instead of trying to space the heads around in a, it kind of like in a, a spoke and try to get within you know a foot and a half or so maximum distance between the, in height between the um, top spur and the bottom spur. On a, on a vertical cordon, you just spur, you go every other, every other position and spur it all the way up the stake. Um, when we are first training young zin, that's essentially what we do, except we don't go up very high. We put about six spurs on a vine, and you have no choice but to almost use alternate shoots as you go up the stake. And then the trick is over the next oh, five to ten years is to limit how high you grow the head and extend the spurs from the bottom so that you get a little bit more uniformity and in the in the height of the spurs because that affects bud break and and the um, and what what section of the vine becomes dominant and also what you try to do is you you spread the you spread the um, shoots out so that you're you're uh, getting less crowding of the clusters with six by eight spacing you we don't go out into the row as much as we go along the row. So that because if you get out too far, you start hitting shoots and you limit tractor access. So did that kind of explain? Okay, and then um, you said goble, and what was the last one? Oh, okay, yeah. That so that's it. You know, eventually on on our on our zins, eventually the the little mini mini vertical cordons become goble. It's just you can't do it all in one year. The old style, when they didn't have a lot of irrigation, was that <clears throat> excuse me, they would 
grow the vines, and then the first year they put one two-bud spur, the second year they'd do two two-bud spurs, the third year, three, every year they'd add a spur, and so that you ended up with, you'd start with a, if you looked at where the, where the um, arms intersected, it was very close to the ground, and then they grew out from there. Our grower down in um, Paso Robles, uh, Benny Ducey, that's what he does to this day, is he replaces vines that die from phylloxera. He, that's, that's what he does. So he doesn't have to thin them as much and um, doesn't have to water them as much either. Yeah, the question is, do we hedge it all? And yes, we do, um, we will, I, I call it more tipping than hedging, and it's just down those rows so that we get tractor access, because in a, in a more, you know, in a moderately vigorous site, they will, at, at eight feet, they will come together. And in Alexander Valley, uh, we, I liked nine feet, it just gives that much more clearance to the tractors. Yes? Can you talk a little bit about water Sure, the, the question. Yeah, the, the question is uh, man, water management, um, irrigation water management, and older vines. And, um, well, let's see. I'd have to make some confessions here. I'm not a neutron probe kind of guy, and I'm not a, um, a, a pressure bomb. I don't, I don't, uh, I mean, I've worked with pressure bombs, but I don't use that. I, I go by visual, um, I, I know my soil types. And I look at the vines because the vines are going to tell you what they need if they if they need water and if they don't. And old vines really um, in in Geyserville they don't really need water except maybe a little bit in a dry spring like we've had this year, or um, sometimes just before harvest if um, you're not happy if if we're not happy with the way the season is going if it's too hot and the uh, ripeness is the sugar level is getting. It is accelerated, but the flavors just aren't there. We will water a little bit. And then um, what I always do, Kay, is um, water at as many cycles as I can after harvest um, so that the leaves stay on the vines as long as possible because they're making energy that they live off of for the next, you know, for the first month and a half or so of the new growing season. Um, in more clay soils, like our, in our Litton Springs vineyard, you have to really watch your soil types, and um, and that is just, it's just a matter of, of good farming and making sure that your vines are growing well in the spring and have adequate water for good good bloom, you know, good set, and then they stop growing by verasion. It's um, you know just like just like Cook always said, you, you want you want them to stop stop growing at verasion, and then um, everything should be fine. If you have four or five feet of um, a meter of shoot growth, then then you're good. Yes. <laughs> the the question is, what is old vine character for me in the wine or in the vines? No, I I um f for me with uh, grape vines, I always say, and it's only because I'm lucky enough to farm some really old vines, is that they should be you know 50 or 60 years old before you call them old vines, and that's because what's the you know if you look at the average age of a vineyard these days in California, well, it used to be about 25 years. Now it's maybe down to 17 years. So if you can go, you know, two or three times that, they've got to be old, right? Um, old vine character on, in the wine has a, a lot to do with, for me, with the mid palate and the finish. The, the mid palate on, on old vines versus um, younger vines has, uh, is more nuanced, more textures. It's, um, it is not necessarily thicker, but it, it covers the tannins really well and in the, on the mid palate and all the way into the finish so that you end up with something that you're savoring for a long time after you've swallowed. That's, with young vines, it's all up front and fruit, and then oftentimes you can have a little hollowness in, in the middle, and the finish is always shorter, always. And when we, when, as, uh, when we have old, or excuse me, when we have young vines, we try to get them a little bit riper so that that sometimes that will cover that hollowness in the mid palate and but the the finish is never the same it always is a little bit faster on young vines yes you, do a, a cold soap? you know it, it, it all depends on the temperature <laughs> that the grapes come in if if they come in cool um, yeah we have a de facto cold soap we don't do it on purpose um, we just don't turn the heat on 
if they come in hot and if they've already started to ferment often, because um, then there's not much we can do. We're, we have the cooling on immediately so that we, you know, we don't kill the kill the yeast. Um, yeah, typically because we don't inoculate, it can do it can go from one to three days before we get any real fermentation going. Uh, but it, it, like I said, it mostly depends on the season and the. Um, and the temperature of the grapes as they come in. When it's really warm in Sonoma, we will pick at night or, or really, really early in the morning, like three o'clock in the morning, to try to get some grapes in cooler. Um, but you know, the way, during a heat spell, like in 04, there were some nights that I don't think it was below 70 or 75. So that's, that's pretty warm already. <clears throat> Is that it? Well, thank you. Oh, one more. Yep. Oh, uh, the question was about enzymes or any, any additions. We, we'll put about 35 parts per million of sulfur in the crusher, and then we won't sulfur again until we have, we're finished with malolactic. Um, as far as any enzymes, no, we, we, we don't do that. Um, you don't need to with Zen, really, um, and, or any, white, any red wines to, you know, that I don't think you need to anyway. But is that it? Yeah, thank you. Thank you.